So we're almost there. Last paper. Greg, you did it. <laughs> Carrying the feeling. In autistic Lucy Blackman's writing, carrying attaches itself to nouns. Quote, when I refer to something within myself, she writes, I often use the word carrying as an adjective just before the word for the emotion or whatever. So when I draft what I want to say, the word carrying frequently appears, but I usually edit it out so it doesn't confuse or distract other people. What do I mean by carrying the world? Carrying moves the noun. With this motor attached to it, the noun becomes a field of sensation, making felt the ineffable more than of perception, the welling non-conscious activity of experience in the making. As an autistic writing herself into neurotypical experience, Blackman feels the carrying needs to be edited out, not experientially, of course, but linguistically. The more than of experience in the making must be left unspoken. And yet this more than cannot so easily be excised. It remains active despite her desire to background it. We hear it in her descriptions of neurodiversity. It lurks in her prose. It enlivens her metaphors. It is there when she talks about her experience of a body, articulating the difficulty she has in defining where the body ends and the world begins. It is there when she speaks of the challenge of moving in a world that refuses to settle itself into a stable locus where objects and subjects are clearly differentiated. Everywhere, Blackman's experience is one of carrying, one that privileges the felt experience of emergent relation. For her, a body is a carrying across, a relational field that incorporates the environment in its infinite metamorphosis. Carrying is always tied to movement. As I've outlined elsewhere, to move as an autistic is to live in paradox. On the one hand, there is nothing but movement, most of it non-voluntary, which for neurotypically inflected existence translates as strange, unpredictable, disturbing. The autistic body simply moves too much. On the other hand, it is the same overabundance of movement moving that keeps the autistic singularly open to perception in its most complex iterations, making directly felt the world's edgings into itself. I quote from Naoki Higashida, Sometimes I pity you for not being able to see the beauty of the world in the same way we do. Really, our vision of the world can be incredible, just incredible. When you see an object, it seems that you see it as an entire thing first, and only afterward do its details follow on. But for people with autism, the details jump straight out at us first of all, and then only gradually, detail by detail, does the whole image sort of float up into focus. This capacity to directly perceive experience informing, what I have called autistic perception, involves a continuous carrying, a moving with of experience in the making. This paper asks, what if we took this carrying, which Blackman feels she has to background for neurotypical consumption, and made it the motor of experience? What if we said that carrying is precisely what motivates an experience to become what it can do? And how would this approach affect the ubiquitous association of neurotypicality with what I call the agency volition intentionality triad. What Blackman calls carrying the feeling is all about the movement of a subjectivity very much in flux. Feeling here, as in Whitehead, is not to be understood as an external response to an existing event. Feeling is what defines the quality of the event in the event, 
There is here no external subjectivity. The subject, as in Whitehead, is not the activator of the act, but what emerges in the act. Whitehead calls this emergent individual the subjective form of the event. The subjective form, the subject of the event, event's speciation, does not necessarily resemble a human subject. The subjective form is how the assemblage of the event's, comp uh, of the event's composition comes into itself. These subjective forms are oriented by what Whitehead calls the event's subjective aim. The subjective aim, the event's minor gesture, orients the event toward its actualization. Whitehead calls the process toward actualization concrescence, emphasizing the sense of a growing in the event. Subjective aim is key here as a lure for feeling. Feeling is the force in the event that lures experience into a tendency to form. An occasion of experience is the fullness of what a feeling has felt as actualized through a singular subjective form. This subjective form carries both the feeling in its operative fullness as virtual force and the inact of what that feeling has felt in this singular instance. The feeling, like Blackman's carrying feeling, is that which moves the event toward what Whitehead calls its satisfaction. It is the event's agency. With carrying as a motif, I will here propose a shift to agencement as the concept best capable of carrying agency. Agencement, the directed intensity of a compositional movement that alters the field of experience. When Blackman writes that her feelings, quote, are my carrying, vibrations, flashes, visual blocks, touch horrors, smell tickles, and the crossover that comes from them, what she is saying, it seems to me, is that experience doesn't easily resolve for her. Subjective forms are elusive. What is far more current in her experience are carrying feelings, feelings that do not emerge from a stable place, i.e. a predefined body, or land in any kind of predictable formation. Feelings remain lures. In a neurotypical accounting of experience, there is a tendency to organize feeling forms into articulations that parse experience into manageable bits. But something else is always also at stake in the operations of expression. Carrying is a conduit of all experience, in all experience. It is what underlies the mobility of perception. The main difference between the autistic and the neurotypically inclined is not the modality of perception as such, but how perception is fielded. In the neurotypical, because the fielding is, a more, direct, is more direct in the sense that parsing happens more quickly, the feeling of the subjective form's inherent multiplicity is not as foregrounded. This is what allows the neurotypical to be so certain that experience begins with them, in the body, in the human. If we view subjectivity from the perspective of autistic perception, on the other hand, the heterogeneity of feeling makes it more palpable that subjectivity is in the making, in the field. Subjectivity is not felt as predetermining, but rather is connected to the field of experience as it informs it. Subjectivity is a carrying into existence of feeling forms self-defining. Subjectivities happen, but they are not where experience begins and ends. They exist in the event of their coming to be. There is persistence of subjectivities, but not as fully formed entities. Subjectivities persist in form, in germ. This persistence is what we call history. History, from a process philosophy perspective, is the serial activating of a certain degree of continuity. The mistake would be to see this continuity as pure becoming. It is not a continuity of becoming, as Whitehead might say, but a becoming of continuity. Persistence is never persistence of the same, but persistence of a cut that activates the conditions for a seriality in the making. Serialities in the making rely on the conditions that support their retelling, 
Neurotypicality is one of those conditions for which the cut of subjectivity is persistently defined. The idea of the neurotypical as building block of human existence is so persuasive that not only is it rarely defined as such, but most of us have overlooked the ways neurotypicality structures our original myths, starting from the idea that humans are distinctly above all other forms of life, all the way to the idea that certain forms of human life are more worthwhile than others. Neurotypicality takes for granted what the human should be by and by that uh, sorry neurotypicality takes for granted what the human should be and by extension limits the breadth of what a human subjectivity might look like. Here, a kind of mutated natural selection is still at work that believes that the fittest, those we've already given the title to, are the ones who, to whose image we must conform. The neurotypical mantra, I can, based on a very narrow definition of volition, deactivates experience rather than opening it to its potential. For if I can't, what's the use? And in the longer paper here, I, I mention, amongst other things, that in Europe now, 98% of uh, Down syndrome fetuses are aborted. So lest you don't think that we have strong tendencies of exclusion when it comes to what it means to be human. We have lots of examples. My proposition is that with carrying as the silent refrain that moves experience in the making, this mantra begins to fall apart. Who is the I in the ecological field of experience in the making? How does I figure in the crossover Blackman writes about, the crossover that tickles and triggers, that feels the movement in its coloring of experience? How does I figure in an account such as Higashida's where, quote, the voice I can't control is different? Or in autistic Donna Williams' complex account of how humans are less bodies than edgings, quote, I knew people by their edges. Where does I figure in Ralph Savary's important account of autotype as relational activity, autotype defined as the persistently poetic coming to language of autistics who use facilitated communication? Where does I figure in Lucy Blackman's assertion that, quote, the most interesting reality in my life is the relationship between facilitation and autism? The account of facilitation as extra to the autistic, where the, quote, successful autistic is the one who no longer needs facilitation, is built on a neurotypical identity politics that takes subject-based agency as its driving force. Nowhere in this account is there room to consider how agencement works in the event of communication, or even how facilitation is also part of neurotypically inflected experience. Agencement, it bears repeating, is not an action directed by an existing subject, but a force of distributed directionality in the event, each event, including the event of facilitation and that of facilitated communication, which I explore in the longer paper, crafts tendencies towards subjectivation, sometimes leaving traces that connect to subjects in the making, sometimes not. What I want to argue is this. In the navigation of experience, no one is ever alone, and no experience ever emerges without the facilitation of a process that carries the event to its, in its coming to formation. Lucy Blackman makes it clear that for her, facilitation cannot be reduced to an active-passive relationship, nor is facilitation strictly reduced to hands-on assistance. It, doesn't, it does not simply mean to, quote, create a path for reaching certain objectives, end quote. Quite the contrary. For Blackman, facilitation is about developing a reciprocity in a field of experience that unlocks directed movement in a way that enables communication in and beyond language. Quote, all I know is that some kind of touch or reciprocity makes me calmer. And the greater certainty of success in hitting the key that I visualize means that I can express the visual language which for so many years I had been cherishing. Facilitation happens in the relation. And I just want to say here, in case you're not familiar with facilitated communication, that about 
20 years ago now, um, it was discovered first through cerebral palsy um, and then through autism and then through Parkinson's and other motor um, uh, and other diseases or, or conditions that affect the, the motor spectrum that um, with the activation people could um, type on a keyboard and that a lot of people who can't speak with their voices can't speak because of a motor issue. And so facilitated communication means activating the process so that the the person can type. And this activation can take many forms. It can take the, the voice, it can, take, it can mean a presence in the room, it can mean a, a touch on the shoulder, or it can mean the holding of the wrist. It, it really depends on, on the person. But the other thing I just want to say quickly is that there's a really strong politics to this. Last, uh, last week, or about two weeks ago, um, a, a, a person who is, is a facilitator um, in, a, in a relationship with an autistic um, lost a court case and was sentenced to 30 years in prison for, um, for a very, it's a very complicated case where, where she and the person she was facilitating fell in love. But what, we can discuss this further, but the point I wanted to make is that he was never allowed to use facilitated communication in the courtroom because it was judged to be an, uh, a science that couldn't be proven. And so he was never able to, um, to speak. And so we, we are living in a time where this question of facilitation ha has real consequences. In the context of writing, Blackman describes facilitation as regulating an impulse. Her words simply don't transfer to the keyboard easily. She writes, in my mind I feel as if my hand is moving in the direction of each letter key, but that impulse doesn't transfer itself to my real hand unless something is triggering the movement. By trigger, I don't mean a jerk or push. If you were to point at something, the trigger would be your intent. However, the intention or motivation in my mind somehow gets lost in my body. For her, touch, even a simple contact on the thigh, quote, is the conduit that gets some kind of impulse more organized, end quote. How to think of this contact, of this relation, in other terms than those of the worn dichotomy of independence, dependence, or volition, non-volition. Perhaps the best place to begin is with movement. Neurotypically inflected movement is usually taken to be voluntary. The presupposition tends to be that the subject moves the movement. I want an apple, I reach for an apple, I take the apple into my hand, I move the apple to my mouth, I bite the apple. The neurotypical takes this sequence for granted, believing that the motion was unfacilitated, placing the eye at the center of each gesture. The autistic, on the other hand, because of sequencing issues and difficulties with activation, may not be capable of, quote, volitionally grabbing and eating the apple. The apple may, nonetheless, get taken and eaten, but it might just as well end up staying on the counter because for some strange reason the body moved away from the table. Voluntary, non-voluntary would be an easy dichotomy to use to separate out these two experiences. But if instead of beginning with agency we turn to agencement, asking not what the subject did but what the event proposed, another version of the task comes to light. Let's say that in both cases we are in the same kitchen, the tending toward apple for the neurotypical, and I, I should say that I don't believe there is such a thing as a neurotypical, right? I hope that's clear. Is likely facilitated first by a sense of hunger. In this situation, hunger may seem solely located in the body, but it is actually an effect of the field. Think, for instance, of how often str hunger strikes at the idea of food, without first a conscious sense of being hungry. In these cases, the food acts as an agencement to hunger, activating the experience of, quote, a body feeling hungry. This is equally the case when the food isn't actually there. When this happens, the subjective aim is tuned to a virtual object. In either case, actually or virtually, pulled by the sense of hunger, you find yourself reaching. I'm sorry if I'm making you hungry. The apple becomes the facilitator for a gesture that does not strictly belong to you. 
This gesture is an, in an ecology of hunger, hunger apple body movement. The apple activates it in co-occurrence with the feeling of hunger and the reaching response. What is emerging is an event of hunger appeasement. In the reaching, something else happens as well. Perceptually, a parsing has occurred that singles out the apple from the counter and everything around it. This parsing with the non-sensuous perception that accompanies it also brings along a felt impression that the apple has a specific size, depth, and weight. You see it as an object, and in doing so, you unsee the environment with which it co-composes. This allows the reaching to be precise. You grab it, and the apple finds itself in your hand exactly as you had previously seen, felt it, or so it seems. This grabbing, which included a seeing touch previous to the actual touching, was made possible by the hapticity in the visual perception, which provided, in advance of the actual touching, a sense of what the apple might feel like, a feeling that likely also is starting to include a preconscious tasting. Your mouth is already watering. This doubling of touch vision mixed with the tripling of touch taste vision, which includes a singular parsing for hunger, hunger apple reaching, allows you to grab the apple and bring it to your mouth. You take a bite of it, likely unaware of the complex movement just executed. But what if the parsing isn't so straightforward, as it never is with autistic perception? What if event paths collide and the more than is revealed in all of its contradictions as the surplus that should have been excluded? What if the apple refuses to resolve itself clearly for perception, backgrounding itself instead in experience? And what if the vase beside it, reflecting the sunlight, actually stands out much more? In this case, the hunger agencement might be redirected toward a light reflection agencement, thus leading the autistic's movement toward the vase despite what they initially perceived as their actual interest in the apple. This might confuse the onlooker, who might then assume that the autistic wasn't hungry, or worse, that she couldn't distinguish vase and apple. If this is the case, other techniques will need to be invented that facilitate the right balance between depth, perception, color, tactility, hunger, and movement. Placing carrying in front of words is a way of inscribing for thought in language, this necessity of relation, foregrounding how each act necessitates its own variety of carrying across the field of experience. Facilitation opens up experience, accommodating the agencements of the field in its co-composition. And yet, because agency and volition are so prized in the neurotypical worldview, it continues to be seen as a counter to, quote, really individual expression. The concept of facilitation troubles the neurotypical aligning of volition, intentionality, and agency, I am, of course, not suggesting that no will is present in movement. Volition always has a role to play in the way expression arises. A shift away from the triad simply suggests that volition is not where we usually assume it is. It is not ahead of experience, but in experience, in the between of the conscious and the non-conscious, actively composing in the ecology of practices. This has ethical consequences. What is at stake in the pervasive account of aligning subject-based volition to experience? What happens to our unwavering belief in neurotypicality as the measure of human existence when its central tenets are put into question? Similarly, what happens to the narrative of neurodiversity when we stop speaking of the involuntary, or better said, the non-voluntary, as though it were other to quote, better ways of moving, of thinking, of speaking. William James's essay, The Feeling of Effort, is very interesting in this regard. Written in 1896, um, beautiful piece that I recently found. Beginning with an account of neurotypical experience, James explores the place of volition in movement. Here, he proposes a vocabulary for feeling that refuses to be led by a concept of subject-based agency, exploring instead, like Whitehead does, how the aim, active in the event, creates the conditions for the act in its unfolding. <clears throat> 
In the feeling of effort, James sees the feeling as occurring, quote, inside the tissue of experience, end quote. Yet while created in the relation, quote, made by relations that unroll themselves in time, end quote, the feeling of effort only comes into itself as such through the motor of a terminus. So this follows well on what Brian was talking about. The terminus is what vectorizes the agencement, pulling the force of form to singular expression. This motor is not the end point in any direct sense. It is a force that activates the movement. The terminus acts as the pull, setting up the field that becomes what James calls the knower known relation. The field's concern for its parsing cannot be separated out from what is experienced. The pull of the terminus moves the event, but is not the event. How the event comes to be in its subjective, fo or its subjective form is how the knower known relations have resolved themselves for this singular occasion, coming together just this way. The coming into itself of the event is therefore not simply goal-oriented. The terminus is not the end as seen from a neutralized external perspective. Terminus is the operative pull of this coming to be, not its predetermining result. If the autistic grabs the vase instead of the apple, it is too simple to say that her body didn't go where her mind wanted to which is how it generally is theorized. What actually happened is that the apple, as terminus, despite being the motor of the event, was supplanted by the insistence of the light ray, which monopolized the event and its informing to such a degree that it ended up becoming the conduit for the reaching movement. This, as James might say, was what the event ended up, quote, having in mind. This is not to deny the frustration of the hungry autistic who, ha who now has a vase in her hand. It is to emphasize that the voluntary-involuntary dichotomy devalues the complexity of what has actually happened. Neurotypical experience is not so different. It en its ends simply look different because what the event had in mind more often seems to cohere with where the movement was initially going. The challenge is to understand the agencement of terminus as an activity of the field itself and to become aware of the back gridding necessary even on the neurotypical end of the spectrum to make the terminus conform in its generative pull to the subjective aim. The feeling of effort can perhaps assist us in understanding this play in the terminus between agencement and aim. Where, James asks, is effort situated in the body? Can it be consciously aligned to a muscle? Does the effort, quote, come from us? For James, the feeling of effort is less connected to a specific tissue or muscle mass in the body than to the field of experience. The feeling of effort, he writes, creates the function. It is the terminus that activates the sequencing, which, as James underlines above, quote, now proves itself to be what the concept had in mind, end quote. Movement folds through movement, its parsing activated not by a volition occurring outside the event, but by the very flow of movement moving non-consciously, coursing through the pull of the terminus. But what happens when the terminus is a region of incipient activity? Turning to autistic perception, where the terminus is less differentiated or more mobile, the question is to what degree the reaching for the vase instead of the apple must be read as a movement gone wrong. In this context, how do we understand James's proposition that, quote, the end conceived will, when these associations are formed, always awaken its own proper motor idea. And in James's work, uh, the motor idea is what he's using in, in, in 1896, and terminus comes up then in um, Essays and Radical Empiricism, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's the same concept, or a development of the same concept. Termini, or motor ideas, are infinite and variable. The terminus is not one movement one object reached toward, but a region of variation. For the neurotypical, whose ability to parse in movement is more available than for the autistic, the parsing can seem projective and therefore voluntary. The apple rests in the hand because there was the intention to take the apple off the counter. But how many times have you landed at the refrigerator with the door open and wondered what you were there for? 
How many times have you wandered around the bedroom, not me, looking for your reading glasses, the ones hanging around your neck? <laughs> Movement only seems voluntary in the neurotypically inflected reflective consciousness, and I'm not suggesting that Brian's neurotypical. Hopefully that's clear as well. Movement only seems voluntary in the neurotypically inflected reflected consciousness because it connects with what the concept had in mind to the degree that there is a lack of feeling of effort. It all seems straightforward, you think, as you bring the apple to your mouth. The movement comes from me. And yet, there's still the issue of the open fridge. Quote, the end conceived will always awaken its own proper motor idea, writes James. That a movement will, in conscious reappraisal, be found to have aligned to what the event had in mind is what makes the movement seem subject directed. Because the frame of the movement for the most part fits our idea of where we needed to go, we align the two and are confident the movement emerged from our personal directives. And when this fails, for instance, when we miss our mouths with our water glass, we laugh and say we must have been distracted. But attention is more complex than this, and this is what we learn from, aut from autistic perception. And in the longer work, I go much further on this question of attention. Not today. There is often a presumption that volition and attention work together. In this kind of analysis, attention is seen as that which is consciously directed by the subject. But attention, as I've suggested elsewhere, is more distributed than it is situated. It emerges in the event, activated by the force of directionality, the event calls forth. This dance of attention, where it is the field that attends and attention is less parsed than environmental, is alive in autistic perception. It is true to say that in the more neurotypically inflected experience, attention does land more easily. But even here, it would be a misnomer to suggest that it lands on a predefined subject or object. Attention lands as a vector, activating the subjective form of the event, not a subject pre-categorized. Like the feeling of effort, attention is called from the event, its force a pull that organizes the event into the tendency it will follow. Moved by the directedness of the event's force of form, attention dances toward the singular experience it has revealed. What autistic perception makes clear is that there is a gap in movement moving that opens up the experience to its more than, creating a schism in what, it comes, to, in what comes to be. This gap is more about an overfeeling than a lack. And, and elsewhere, I've talked a lot about how this this uh, belief that autistics are not relational is, is a, I mean, it's just completely false. The, the, there's a hyper-relationality that is, that is experienced through autistic perception, which doesn't focus on the human it, precisely because it is always engaging with the more than of, of a fielding of experience before what they call the chunking of experience. For the neurotypical, this unparsable share tends to get overlaid by inhibition. It is what we actively don't experience. And this is really James' point. That, so I'll, I'll just say this again. So that, that, that inhibition plays a central role in our capacity to experience because it leaves out what could have been experienced. This is why we don't tend to actively perceive it. James suggests that the feeling of volition is less about volition than about inhibition. This is why we feel it as effort. The feeling of effort comes from actively not doing, not seeing, not moving. The effort is felt because of what didn't happen. What we call voluntary is what we have actively not done. The inhibition does not necessarily happen at the level of conscious thought. When I don't pick up the vase instead of the apple, it's not because I'm actively resisting it. It's because the apple stands in instead. The vase's presence is actively being inhibited. In the apple standing in, the vase has actually disappeared, or at least unappeared for perception in lieu of the apple-directed hunger act of reaching toward. In autistic experience, not only is there, due to issues with impulse control, much less tendency for inhibition, but autistic perception is by its very definition more field-oriented. 
As a result, field attention is more present and the termini are more tuned to their incipient variability. This tends to take movement out of its presuppositional feeling of volition, thereby de-emphasizing the perceived difference between volition and non-volition, um, the conscious and the non-conscious. As Donna Williams writes, when you resonate with an object or surface, it is not so much that you have reached out for that object or surface, but that it has somehow reached into you. In its effortlessness, autistic perception reaches into the you you are becoming. What isn't asked often enough is, what else? What other kinds of communication? What other potentials for movement? What other fields of encounter are possible from this uninhibited field of relation? If movement is by nature non-voluntary, generated to attention by its dance in the between of subjects and objects informing, a new definition of facilitation must be invented. The facilitator must be seen as more than a person. Facilitators are carriers, conduits for the modulation of an eventful environment. In this facilitation of facilitation, there emerges the capacity for the environment to come to attention in a way that facilitates the invention of new modes of expression. And I go on a lot longer about this, but now I'll close. This is a political call. The identity politics of neurotypicality are too dominant and too pervasive for autistics to fight alone. Carrying the feeling is not an individual practice. It is collective at its very core. Carrying the feeling is a relational movement, relational in its capacity to make felt the intercurrent, as James might say, of the inact and the act. Here, where life is not directed by inhibition and modes of expression entangle the conscious and the non-conscious, where the non-voluntary finds its poetic voice, new ways of living become imaginable. And I mentioned Audi type earlier. If you're unfamiliar with facilitated communication, um, what is really interesting about it is that to my knowledge, in every country, in every language, when autistics come to writing through facilitated communication, they don't immediately write prose but poetry. They learn, they can learn, of course, they do learn, um, but it's poetry first, rhythm. What if parsing weren't foregrounded as the method for successful living? What if the non-voluntary weren't such a threat? What if freedom were more widely understood as the creative force of the inact? What else would we be capable of thinking, feeling? Donna Williams writes, I was deeply mesmerized with all things aesthetic and sensory from at least six months of age. Autistics have this uh, also um, incredible memory, and they, many, many of them speak about very, very early memories. Meaning, being meaning deaf, I saw musically. Being face blind, I was attuned to movement patterns. Being object blind and context blind, I'd, I'd tap everything to make noise, to hear its voice, flick it to feel its movement, turn it to experience how it caught light, toss and drop and shred and snap and sprinkle grass, sand, twigs, leaves. I'd lick and wrung my hands and face over surfaces, wrap myself into fabrics. I'd align myself with symmetry and lines, mold myself into forms to feel their shape as as them stare at colors and lights and shapes, trying to become one with them. Donna Williams was institutionalized for much of her life. Facilitation aligns to the field of relation, to its tastes, its feelings, its imminent shapings, and it carries this differential potential across the productive abyss of non-conscious and conscious experience. The alignment to a mobile environment in the making, this is facilitation. Let this be our challenge, to collectively create techniques to carry further the alignment to difference alive in autistic perception. <laughs>